Long before the first ships from Europe reached the distant shores of tropical Africa, a powerful and peaceful network of trade already existed. It was a vast commercial system whose markets and links by land and sea stretched as far as India and China. Its African heart lay far from the coast, here in the great medieval empire of Mali. Today, Mali is among the poorest countries in the world. But 600 years ago, it was a land of wealth and comfort. This is Jenne, still a flourishing market town, but once a commercial center of far-ranging importance. Jenne guaranteed the prosperity of a great regional system, attracting camel caravans which brought merchandise from all points of the compass. The reason is explained in a single word. This was an economy based on gold. And that gold is much in evidence, even today. The fascinating story of the caravans of gold may be unknown or quite forgotten in the outside world, but here in Jenny it's a story that remains vividly alive. Even a little side street of this ancient city, once part of the great empire of Mali, can afford a glimpse of rich traditions from the past. The fine jewellery of his craft still reflects the brilliance of the golden trade of old West Africa. The smith usually works from quantities of gold dust melted in a crucible and then fashioned by skillful beating into shapes long hallowed by tradition. The design of these earrings may reflect the art of the individual craftsman but it never strays too far from the recognized styles preferred by the different peoples of the region, Bambara, Mandinka, Soninke, and others. Each of these peoples has its own distinctive jewelry. The size, rather than the style, gives an indication of a person's standing. Here, gold has always been used as much for display as for a standard of wealth. By about AD 1250, the oldest gold fields along the upper reaches of the Niger River to the west of Jenni were becoming exhausted. But to the great advantage of trading towns like Jenni, a new source of gold began to be developed. Rich quantities of gold now came from the country to the south, today part of the modern Republic of Ghana. This development brought power and wealth to the forest people and in due course to those of the kingdom of Ashanti. Today, King Apoku Ware, traditional ruler of Ashanti, can still display the glittering opulence which so astonished the first Europeans who visited this kingdom founded three centuries ago. The Ashanti use of gold is lavish and extraordinary. 
and it reflects the golden wealth of the grand empires of Western Africa in the Middle Ages. More than 900 years ago, a North African historian described the royal court and ceremonial of that distant time in the empire of ancient Ghana, almost as though he were describing King Opokuware of today. The king adorns himself like a woman, wearing necklaces and bracelets of gold. Behind him stand pages holding shields and swords decorated with gold, and on his right are the sons of the subordinate kings of his country, all wearing splendid garments and their hair plaited with gold. Today, most of the king's political power has gone. But in accordance with tradition, the king still has the right to promote his subordinate chiefs to higher ranks. These chiefs, as on similar occasions in the past, come forward one by one to reaffirm their loyalty and offer royal praises. Ashanti power rested on farming prosperity and military strength, but its gold had long attained a far wider influence. By a fortunate blessing, the majestic Niger, called by its people the River of Singers, lay to the north. A learned Egyptian visitor of the 14th century described this great trading region as four months of travel long and four months wide. The Mali Empire was, in fact, among the biggest trading systems in the world, with its roots in the gold of Western Africa. From the markets of the Upper Niger to those of Hausaland and Bornu, a distance wider than Western Europe, the Niger still carries a daily traffic whose style and tone speak for an ancient stability and peace. Mama, mama. Gold here was always important, but nobody can eat gold. The Nidra has always provided fish in abundant quantities, and that's a vital source of protein in a local diet based largely on cereals. With no means of refrigeration in this hot climate, immediate drying or smoking of the fish has been essential, if they are to be kept for any length of time. By custom, this work is done by women, who usually share the profit on a family basis. Smoke-dried fish is carried and sold to towns and villages far from the river itself. A day's journey from Jenne downstream along this broad river highway, traders reach Mopti. Nowadays, the biggest market along this section of the Niger.
I've come to this port on the great inland waterway of West Africa, the River Niger, more than a thousand miles from the sea, because it's always been a vital artery of trade. And in this port and others like it, the wealth of this vast inland region arrived and departed fashionable cottons from Hauserland, tusks of ivory from grassland hunters, cola nuts from the forests of the south, foods in bulk such as sorghum, bars of iron, bars of copper, and most precious of all, the biggest underlying standard of trading value, gold. The women wear their immensely valuable regalia in perfect safety. It seems that this sense of security is by no means new. A famous traveler of the 14th century visited the Empire of Mali when it was still at the height of its prosperity and recorded this in his memoirs. Of all peoples, the Negroes are those who most abhor injustice. There is complete and general safety throughout the land. The traveler here has no more reason than the man who stays at home to fear brigands, thieves, or ravishers. The man who wrote those words was a traveling scholar from Morocco named Ibn Battuta. And fortunately for us, his memoirs have survived, recalling much of the vivid detail of West Africa as it was 600 years ago. Here is his description of Mali's imperial court. On certain days, the Sultan holds audiences in the palace yard where there is a platform under a tree. It is carpeted with silk and over it stands an umbrella which serves as a kind of silken pavilion surmounted by a bird in gold. On his head, the Sultan wears a golden skull cap. His usual dress is a velvety red tunic made out of costly European fabrics. The Sultan is preceded by musicians who carry gold and silver guitars and behind him come 300 armed slaves. The wide prosperity of the West African interior called for a unifying form of government. And that was provided through almost a thousand years by the old empires, ancient Ghana, then Mali, and then Songhai and Bornu. These old empires ensured a widely accepted stability and peace. Word about the wealth of these lands got out in time, even to distant Europe. A famous Spanish map of 1375 portrayed the source and controller of that wealth. While the outline of North Africa was already known, the map gave Europe for the first time pictorial news of the far interior. Beneath the desert wastes of the Sahara, in the middle of the empire of Mali, the map showed the figure of a Berber camel rider, who might almost be Ibn Battuta himself. He's shown approaching the mighty Lord of Mali, seated on his throne and holding aloft a splendid orb of gold. This emperor was rumored to be the wealthiest man on the face of the earth. In 1324, an earlier emperor of Mali, Kankan Musa, was returning from a pilgrimage to Mecca. Eager to enhance the prestige of Islam, he decided to convert his trading city of Timbuktu 
into a center of learning and religion. At the heart of this Islamic city, Emperor Musa built a mosque that set a new style in West African architecture. It was the beginning of Timbuktu's wide and well-deserved reputation as a focus of African scholarship, teaching Islamic law and politics, as well as theology. Writing soon after 1500, a visitor from Spain set down his impressions. In Timbuktu, there are numerous judges and learned men, all well supported by the ruler of the city. Many handwritten books from North Africa are sold here, and there is more profit to be had from this book trade than from any other branch of commerce. Based on the written word, the teachings of Islam brought to these lands a new literacy, still very much alive today. Like Muslim children everywhere, these youngsters have to learn the Quran by heart. But they must do it in Arabic, a language that's not their own. It was and is a stern training, an old-fashioned discipline, not intended to be fun. Islam exercised a profound and permanent effect on West African life. Through the influence of Islamic scholars, this great region became an intellectual part of a wide world across many frontiers. At heart, the teachings of the Prophet were a code of strict moral behavior, a set of rules to help men govern their personal inner lives. But Islam also had its public face. Rules were established for credit and pricing, all of which led to more efficient ways of organizing trade. There's not much business here any longer, but Timbuktu, after about 1300 AD, became and remained a market town of widespread fame. To this northernmost point on the River Niger, goods came up from Jenne, and here, merchants and dealers from every neighboring country got together with the Berber traders who made the voyage across the great desert. For me, this is one of Africa's truly dramatic scenes, just because it shows a crucial link in Africa's historical development. Even now, on certain days, you can walk out from Timbuktu and glimpse the inner drama of trans-Saharan trade. On this day, these Tuareg Berbers who operate the camel caravans are bringing a load of salt southwards from the service mines at Taudeni, 500 miles to the north, a journey of 21 days each way. And on their journey northward in the heyday of the old prosperity, they also carried gold. The arrival of the caravan will be greeted with music and dancing.
Against the background of their harsh environment, the Tuareg travelers of the desert have created a musical culture full of elegance. The caravan's arrival is an occasion for these Tuareg people to celebrate their skill in mastering the relentless trails of the Sahara. And there's joy and relief at having reached another journey's end. Here I'm some way out beyond the edge of the southern shore of this vast ocean of sand, the Sahara Desert. And these are the people of the desert, the Tuareg, a hard people who live in a hard land, not a bit romantic in spite of appearances. Today's descendants of the Berber nomads, of who in ancient times mastered the secrets of human survival in the desert and made themselves at home here. Immensely self-reliant, persevering, they became the lords of the long-distance caravan trade long before the camel was known in these regions, and that was 2,000 years ago. I like to think of the crucial part played by these voyagers, always facing the perils of the desert, traveling through weeks and months, navigating by guess or by intuition, or else navigating by the stars. Sixty days of riding and walking were needed to cross the Sahara, a daily average of about 25 miles between the ports of the opposing shores. Several main routes led from oasis to oasis. Some went through the western Sahara, others crossed further east, but the eventual destination was Cairo. Almost a generation ago, this film was made of a typical caravan as it came out of the desert through the Atlas Mountains to arrive at Marrakesh, famous among the ports or cities on the northern fringe of the Sahara. In these Berber towns throughout the Middle Ages, the gold of West Africa set the monetary standard for long-distance commerce and provided the substance of their riches. It's the end of Ramadan, a time for celebration. Frequently on the move, these people of the tent, as they like to call themselves, have always controlled the trading routes through North Africa. And long ago, their power and influence were greater still, for their kings and governments ruled a brilliant Islamic civilization in Spain for several hundred years. <laughs> But mostly the Berbers were given to the pleasures of small wars amongst themselves, of which they never seemed to tire.
While Berber clans could unite with each other against an external enemy, strong local loyalties and rivalries usually divided them. The power they once wielded can still be caught on ceremonial days like this, when all their fiery pride is on display. Throughout the Middle Ages, fierce and fast-moving Berber warriors of various clans monopolized all movement of goods across the Sahara. Without them, the intricate trading networks of northern Africa would have withered in the sun. These men were the lords of the desert, and their influence reached from Timbuktu to the proud gates of Cairo. This is the gate of Old Cairo, opening to the south and west, the Bab el Zuela, a superb structure built 900 years ago. Through its majestic portals, century after century, came traders and travelers, generals, even kings from West Africa, North Africa, from Muslim Spain, and sometimes from the countries of Christian Europe. The whole international system of trade of those days reaching as it did from the Atlantic to the Sea of China, had its heart and center here in Old Cairo. city of Islam since the 7th century, Cairo entered a long period of prosperity and power when the sultans of northwest Africa, known as the Fatimid dynasty, moved east from Tunis and established here a new capital. Under the Fatimid sultans, Cairo became a remarkably rich and tolerant city, renowned for its spending on art and scholarship and dominating the commerce of half the world. Ibn Khaldun, a great North African historian, has left us a description of the city he knew as it was at the end of the 14th century. Cairo is the metropolis of the universe, the garden of the world, the gateway of Islam, the throne of kings. A city of castles and palaces, lit by the moons and stars of erudition. And all this grand structure of learning and devotion was underpinned and its credit upheld by a monetary standard of coins minted in African gold.
For years, the most important coin remained the Almoravid or Berber dinar of northwest Africa. Then Europe, emerging from its poverty in the Dark Ages, became at last able to pay for the import of African gold. Florence minted the first European gold coins since Roman times. Other cities followed, and new gold currencies appeared in Spain and the Netherlands, France and Portugal. A new era in commercial development had begun, laying foundations for Europe's supremacy in trade and industry. The new monetary standard moved north as far as England, where a series of gold coins were to culminate in the famous Golden Guinea of Charles II, minted like all the others in gold from West Africa, symbolized by an elephant. Europe depended on Africa for its monetary stability in a trading partnership which we can see reflected in the grand flowering of Renaissance culture. However different they might be in their history and appearance, black people are depicted in these great works of art as the natural equals of white people. This had been the attitude of the Greeks and Romans, and still for a time at least, it remained the attitude of Europe. In that ever surprising new dawn of the Renaissance, the essential unity of mankind was not in question. But African trading links reached far beyond Europe. To the east of Cairo lay the great sea routes to India and China. The sailing rig in use today has changed very little since the great trading days of the past. East African sailors were attacking their ships against the wind up to an angle of 35 degrees long before Europeans had learned the necessary technique. The Africans who manned and still man these vessels are the Swahili, a coastal people who speak their own African language. Really? These mariners were at home on the highways of the sea, just as in West Africa the camel caravans traversed the Saharan Ocean of Sand so did the ships of the Swahili traverse their ocean of water. Once again, this time in the east, linking the African interior with the markets of the world. This is Lamu, a charming little town on the northern coast of Kenya. It was the destination of many of the ships coming down from the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, and some from as far away as India and even China. They timed their voyages to take advantage of the seasonal monsoon winds which blow back and forth between the Swahili coast and northern India. The ships brought with them not only goods for sale, but a wide range of ideas and beliefs. The most influential of these came from the lands of Islam to the north. And it was not long before the majority of Swahili had accepted Islam. In spite of this northern influence, much of their culture has remained distinctly and uniquely Swahili and it has kept its own identity. This traditional stick dance is a kind of ballet, but it's also an occasion for individual challenge. And that's very much an element in the culture and character of the Swahili. 
Although the cities of the Swahili in their heyday had a common interest in trade, each of them preferred to stay on its own. They liked to compete against each other, as these men in this stick dance, but had no interest in territorial conquest. Lamu was just one of many Swahili towns, built in coral stone all the way along the coast from Somalia down to Mozambique. The domestic architecture of Lamu has been no mere copy of the styles of Arabia or India. From the outside of a traditional Swahili house, there's really nothing to see except a blank wall and a porch with benches for receiving guests. And even when the handsome front doors are opened, there's still only a blank wall behind them. But once inside, it's a very different story. Six or 700 years ago, when houses like this one first began to be designed and built by Swahili architects for leading men and merchants, there were few houses anywhere else in the world so well designed for comfortable city life. This particular house dates from the early 18th century, but much older examples of Swahili domestic architecture not only demonstrated a unique construction and embellishment, but were built to a high standard of what we now call modern conveniences. Why the inhabitants of London in Elizabethan times were emptying chamber pots out of the window, Swahili residents of Lamu who could afford such a house as this enjoyed the luxury of good internal sanitation. These old Swahili houses spell out for us the basic aims that guided the architects in their design to make the best possible use of local materials, finely plastered coral stone, necessarily short rafters of mangrove tree poles, and then to ensure a high level of domestic privacy, and not least to show off and guarantee the credit worthiness of the owner, so essential in a community whose livelihood always depended on the profits and the risks of long distance trade. Lamu is nowadays the best preserved of the old Swahili coastal towns, but it was by no means the most important. Through excavation or analysis of graveyards such as this one, archaeologists have identified more than 50 Swahili towns all constructed in the same coral stone, a stone which can be readily worked beneath the surface of the ocean, but then takes on a permanent toughness and durability soon after being exposed to the air and sun. And here is one of the best surviving examples of the pillar graves unique to this Swahili coast. And there are, as you see, fine pieces of porcelain from China embedded in this African tomb. Such plates and bowls from ancient China are pointers to the involvement of Africa in the far-reaching networks of Eastern trade long before the coming of the Europeans. Even more striking evidence is provided by this Chinese painting of an African giraffe dating from the year 1414. The giraffe was sent as a gift to the Chinese emperor from one of the cities of the Swahili. Looking rather indignant, it must have endured a voyage of many months. The Swahili cities were built at short distances from each other all down the long East African coastline. The southernmost of them was the chief point which linked the Indian Ocean traders with the gold-producing region of the southern African interior.
On this high and fertile plateau, a flourishing civilization had developed, which, like the kingdoms of West Africa, played a decisive role in the trading patterns of the Middle Ages. And here on these temperate grasslands, a unique culture, emerging in about the 12th century, reached its climax in the splendid buildings which are known today as Great Zimbabwe. Efforts to recapture the essence of Great Zimbabwe culture were undermined a century ago by treasure-seeking Europeans. They came up from South Africa and ransacked this place for gold and jewellery soon after they discovered it. A few pieces escaped the looters, all made from local gold, mined extensively in the area from about the year 800. But perhaps even more surprising are some of the objects found here for which Zimbabwe gold was traded. Delicate ornaments brought across the ocean from China and India. It's evidence like this which has helped historians and archaeologists to piece together the whole great story of long distance trade. That trade had its source in the Zimbabwe cultures of inner Africa, which possessed the skills as well as the wealth to build powerful monuments. On these massive walls, overlooking the entire area, stood sacred bird carvings in stone. They were associated with oracles that were thought to speak for the gods. The religious heart of Great Zimbabwe stood on a hilltop commanding the surrounding countryside. In the valley below, the king had his royal residence. All this activity called for a strong central government, and that government was formed by their king and council, who ruled from here through lesser kings and governors in a wide territory across the vast central plateau of southern Africa. Even now, these mighty walls make an irresistible claim to political power and achievement. 17 feet thick in places and 800 feet in length, they're as big and impressive as a great cathedral. Far too impressive as it turned out for the white settlers of later years. They refused to believe that this could have been the work of Africans, or that these very Africans had a trading network which stretched right across the known world. And far down the East African coast, on this most distant link in the old trading network, there lies hidden the last of its surprises. On a long voyage southward, the traders pursued their route far beyond Zanzibar. There they approached what was once the most important and famous of all the Swahili trading cities. This was Kilwa, on an island close by the coast of modern Tanzania. It's hard to get here, for Kilwa remains quite untouched by the modern world. This is still the only means of approach to one of the most intriguing historical sites in the whole of Africa. Surprising as it must seem, up these steps some 600 years ago came visitors from all the countries of the Golden East, ambassadors, merchants, soldiers, mariners. And what they saw spread out before them as they reached the top was a scene, a sight of remarkable 
and even unique splendor. But ruin struck long ago. Rising to great commercial wealth in about the year 1200, Kilwa was once a place of comfort and urban splendor. Its royal palace, one of the grand buildings of Islamic and Swahili culture, as portrayed in this accurate archaeological reconstruction. Here was one of the high points of civilized development promoted and sustained by Africa's trading networks. Placed on the edge of the ocean skyline, Kilwa was much admired by our old traveling companion, Ibn Battuta. He came here in 1332 and remembered Kilwa as one of the most handsome towns he'd seen in all his travels. This once splendid mosque remains, even in partial ruin, a most impressive religious monument. Here on the distant fringe of the world of Islam, the African citizens of Kilwa honored their membership of that world with a taste and craftsmanship distinctively their own. Founded in the 12th century, the mosque was much enlarged in the 15th, when a patriotic citizen spent a thousand gold dinars on improvements. Very soon after, in the year 1498, an event took place which was to lead not only to the ruin of Kilwa, but in due course to the destruction of the Swahili trading network all along the coast. In that year, for the first time in history, three small Portuguese ships under the command of Vasco da Gama sailed round the Cape of Good Hope and into the Indian Ocean. The European incursion had begun. Returning home, Vasco da Gama reported what he'd seen. And just seven years later, a much larger and more menacing fleet appeared on the horizon. A German eyewitness called Hans Meyer has left an account of what took place. Admiral Dalmeda came here with 14 men of war and six caravels. He ordered the ships to have their artillery ready. At dawn on Thursday the 24th of July, all went into their boats to the shore. They went straight to the palace, and only those inhabitants who did not resist were granted their lives. At the palace, the Holy Cross was put down, and Admiral Dalmeda prayed. Then, everyone started to plunder the town of all its merchandise and provisions. The sack of Kilwa by the Portuguese in 1505 marked a turning point in the history of the whole East African coast. For the Portuguese, and after them the Dutch, the English, the French, seized the Indian Ocean trade and turned it to their own benefit. The old Swahili cities of coral stone, which had depended on that trade and now lost it, fell into decay. Indeed, Africa had now to suffer a long period of destructive conflict and confrontation begun by the outside world and this would continue until these old splendors of the African past were all but forgotten. Come on!